And good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Kripner, and I'm the academic director of the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship, which is uh, one of the institutions that's sponsoring the event this afternoon, along with the economics department. Uh, so we would like to welcome you to the Economics Alumni Forum. Um, this year, the forum is going to look at uh, growing income inequality, both in the United States and throughout the world. Our alumni are going to speak to some of the causes and consequences of this very uh, important uh, process that we're all living through. Our moderator tonight is uh, Rebecca Saxton Fox from the class of 2006. Um, Rebecca is... Uh, <laughs> Rebecca is living proof that you can do exciting things with an econ degree. Uh, she is uh, currently pursuing her master's degree at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, she's concentrating on economic and political development and specializing in management. Uh, and she's recently been selected as a member of the International Fellows Program to study U.S. foreign policy and has been awarded a prestigious merit-based scholarship to participate in this program at the School of International and Public Affairs. Prior to joining Columbia University, Rebecca worked in international development. She spent th over three years working at Orbis International, which is an international NGO dedicated to the prevention and treatment of blindness in the developing world. And this is the exciting part. Uh, as the finance administration manager on board the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital, the world's only airborne opth ophthalmic teaching hospital. Rebecca was responsible for planning and implementing the financial, logistical, and administrative details for 10 programs per year around the world. She managed a budget of $2.7 million and supervised the logistics for an international team of 20 plus about 100 volunteers per year. Her responsibilities included planning and implementing international medical and public health conferences in over 20 countries in South, Southeast, and East Asia, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Within this context, uh, she has had the opportunity to meet and negotiate with ministers of health and many other senior governmental and NGO officials around the world, engaging in discussions about blindness prevention, international public health and service, and the many challenges of conceiving and implementing public policy and public health in the developing world. She graduated from Haverford College in 2006 with a BA in economics. Uh, she served as a teaching assistant in the economics department for the introductory microeconomics class during her senior year and wrote her senior thesis on the impact of economic policies on malnutrition during the Green Revolution in India. Uh, during this time, she developed an interest in international economics, economic development, and public health, and took several courses in these fields. Uh, and uh, she wrote about her Haverford experience that, and this is a quote, at Haverford, economics was very theoretical for me, and I often had a hard time figuring out how it would eventually fit into my professional life after college. Since then, my work experience has showed me firsthand how important it is to have an understanding of economics when working in international health and development. So I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the, back to the college and we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much. You took away part of my speech. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's really good to be here. I haven't been here in a few years, so um, it's nice to be back. Um, my name is Rebecca Saxon Fox, have referred class of 2006. Um, I'm also joined here on stage by our other panelists, Tim Taylor and Jane Doko. Um, we're here to hear from them today about the causes and consequences of income inequality, which, as you know, is a very important and very hot topic right now with the Occupy Wall Street protests. Um, um, so all three of us, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing since Haverford um, to give you an idea of what econ alumni do or just alumni in general do after Haverford. Um, and then they'll speak a bit about income inequality and then we'll have a question and answer session for the panelists. Um, so um, as is already said, I'm a master's student at Columbia University um, studying economic and pol political development and management. Um, my economics background has helped me a lot in my studies so far. Um, I'm studying 
Um, again, I in fact have an economics midterm tomorrow. Um, <laughs> consumer theory, producer theory, economic explanations of tax policies, food stamps. Um, and I'm even using Stata again, so thank you, Professor Ball, for giving me a leg up in my statistics class. Uh, it's very helpful because no one else seems to have ever used it before. Um, uh, so, um, um, like was said already, uh, I wasn't really sure if I would use economics much after I graduated from Haverford. Um, I felt like I had a really good understanding of it, but wasn't really sure how it might fit into health or international health, which is what I was interested in. Um, so after um, Haverford, I won't go through the whole thing again since you just heard, um, heard what I did at Orbis. Um, I, I really supported a lot what we did um, at, at Orbis. We did like a teach a man to fish type thing where we did a lot of training of doctors um, so that they could then um, train their own doctors in their own countries about how to do eye care. Um, but when I was traveling, I realized that it was actually the political and economic systems in all of these countries that I went to that were contributing more to the lack of health care than anything else. Um, so I was, thought about applying to graduate school, and while I was researching exactly what I wanted to study, I came across a WHO article saying that only 20% of a person's health is related to health care, while 55% is related to environmental, economic, political, and societal factors. So I decided to go back to graduate school to study these political and economic um, systems and understand how um, especially NGOs could, could um, operate better within these systems. So when Professor Jelani uh, approached me to be a moderator for this panel, I was trying to think about my own experience traveling and seeing how uh, income inequality between the US and other countries has affected health and access to health care. Um, then I thought about the Arab Spring, which I actually was in the Middle East while this was uh, first going on. Um, and that really started as a protest underlining problems of unemployment, inequality, and a lack of opportunity. And then I remember arriving back here in the US at the end of the summer um, to a country that most people around the world look to as a symbol of success for democracy and capitalism. But I arrived back, and here are the Wall Street protests. Um, and there was an article in the New York Times right when I got back saying, um, talking about uh, extreme income inequality and referenced a bunch of quote, obvious and despairing emblems of disparity in Manhattan, just blocks from where I live. And um, said in 2009, the average in, uh, household income of the top 5% of people in Manhattan was 81 times higher than the bottom 20%. This is like $850,000 average to $10,000 average. So there is no question that um, a lot of Americans are better off than most of the people that I met while I was traveling. Um, so it really raises the question that I think that I and a lot of people in our generation have, which is, um, is domestic income inequality something that we should be really concerned about? Is, uh, the is this the inevitability of democracy and capitalism? Is this where all countries fighting for democracy are headed? Is the, more, is the US more unequal than other developed countries? Have we always been like this? And what are the implications of this inequality on our society as a whole? So our panelists are here to discuss some of these questions, and I hope they'll get you thinking more about the consequences of income inequality on, on our society. So first, we're going to hear from Jane um, Doko, who will be talking about some trends in rising domestic income inequality and wealth inequality over the past few decades. Um, Jane graduated from Haverford in 1998 with a BA in economics. She also has a master's and a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. She is currently an economist at the Federal Reserve Board, a position she's held since 2006, where she's worked on housing finance policy. Her research interests include household decision making among low and moderate income households, housing policy, and tax policy. And her most recent paper, I believe, will be published in the um, next issue of Economic Policy. Um, recently, she was on detail at the Treasury Department to help with the stand-up of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And then after that, we'll hear from Timothy Taylor, um, who's going to discuss more global and historical trends in inequality. Um, Tim is the managing director of the Journal of Economic Perspectives, a quarterly journal distributed by the American Ec Economic Association to over 20,000 readers. He's held this position for 25 years, right? OK. Um, uh, he's also written a textbook called The Principles of Economics, Economics and the Economy, and publishes articles frequently in other journals and magazines. And he keeps up an active blog addressing pressing issues in the economy today. 
He's held numerous teaching positions in economics at institutions like the Teaching Company, University of Michigan, and Stanford. He holds a master's in economics from Stanford and graduated magnum cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Haverford in 1982. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Someone told me if I pushed something, it would be more dramatic. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, great, thanks for having me. It's really nice to be back. Um, uh, like Rebecca said, I graduated from Haverford in 1998. Uh, it's really nice to see um, some familiar faces. Um, it's nice to be on campus in the fall when it's so lovely. Um, you sort of forget um, how, lov how lovely it is. Also, um, I've been away sufficiently long that I actually got lost <laughs> when, I, when I was trying to find the auditorium. I mean, I had a vague sense. I had to look at a map. And once I got here, I was like, wait, I kind of remember it being someplace. In any event, um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm also excited to talk um, about a topic that's um, uh, been at the forefront um, of many uh, uh, policy issues today, but um, I guess before I begin, I need to um, just state the usual disclaimer that I'm only speaking for myself um, and not anyone um, at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, like Rebecca said, and I'm, I'm an economist there, if you say that really quickly, it sounds like I'm saying that I'm a communist at the Federal Reserve Board, and I just want to be clear that that's not the case. Um, the, Federal Reserve Board, contrary to what you might hear in the popular media, is not a communist institution. <laughs> um, so, so why are we here? You know, this being a liberal arts college, there are many perspectives on why we are here. But you know, the reason why we're here in this room today is that um, there's been a lot of recent um, events and media attention and, um, that have brought. Um, income inequality to the forefront of um, sort of a national policy discussion um, going forward in the presidential election um, and in many um, policy debates, particularly those surrounding what's going to happen to the budget and um, sort of certain entitlement programs. Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion of um, inequality. And then also I think, you know, we're all interested in this topic in order to um, think critically about the topic and then also to, to form um, a perspective on whether we think inequality is a problem, if so, how, why, um, and what we can do to um, address uh, this quote unquote problem. So um, I'm, I guess, you know, in the, in the few minutes that I have, um, I'm going to talk very broadly about um, what economists think about inequality, um, touching on how we measure it. Um, and I'm going to present some historical trends. And then I'm going to do some hand waving about what economists think are the causes of um, inequality. Uh, and I think um, Tim is going to take over from that point and talk um, a little bit more about the consequences, also um, some of the policy implications and sort of the um, uh, uh, policies that we think um, can address um, rising income inequality. Um, just as a warning, it's going to sound like um, when I uh, so when I present um, just sort of the economist perspective, it's going to sound like I'm a Republican. Um, I want to <laughs> just lay that out there, <laughs> you know, just so that in the question, you know, in the Q&A session and the discussion that we have, you know, you don't accuse me of being a Republican. <laughs> so in, um, in 2009, uh, this was the distribution of family income. Um, this is uh, taken from survey estimates in the current population survey. And what this is um, basically showing you is that around 5% of households had incomes, uh, or, or families had income under $10,000, um, whereas around 2.5% of families had income $250,000 or above. That's sort of that um, rightmost bar. Um, the median family income in 2009 was $60,000. Um, and so half of families earned above this, this, this amount, half of families earned below this amount. Oops. And then um, the top 10%, which um, I'm going to talk um, in greater detail about uh, going forward in, 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 in a few slides, um, 
they uh, earned at least $150,000 in 2009. And then finally, um, the poverty level for a family of four um, was about $22,000. And so you can see that um, there's a lot of heterogeneity um, to currently, today, um, in the US um, in terms of family income. Now we can um, think about um, sort of broader trends in inequality and what's been happening over time. And so what this is showing is um, the top 10% income share. And so if you think of all of the income in the United States as like a giant pie, and you think about how it's divided across um, you know, households, the top 10% in 2008 um, earned 45.6% uh, of that pie. Now if income were evenly divided, um, that top 10% would be earning 10%. Um, but, but it's not because a, a few households uh, earn a disproportionate share of the income. Um, this is what you find today. And um, I think at this point, it's, it's helpful to just sort of stare at this figure and, and look at where we are today versus where we were, say, in... 1960 versus where we were in 1913. Um, there are a few things that sort of strike out. One is that this high level of inequality that we see today, it's not new. Um, it's been growing since at least 1980, some even argue since you know the 70s. Um, and so to me personally, it's, it's interesting that you know, you see that we're seeing a lot of social unrest um, and in a very visible way today when in fact inequality has been growing, um, you know, at least for the last 30 years. Um, also, if you look at the last sort of, um, say the 2000s, you'll notice um, a few interesting things. Um, one, you see a dip in inequality during the um, 2001 recession. And then you see inequality um, sort of go back up again and then rise to historically um, high levels. Um, in 2008, the top 10% income share, it, that's the second highest it's, it's ever been. The last time it was that high was in 1928 before, um, uh, before the, the Great Depression. And also um, what's notable is that during sort of um, the Great Depression and then World War II, um, you see um, a great, a, 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 a fairly sizable compression in the income distribution for a very um, long and extended period of time. Um, and this had many people, um, you know, say, you know, many scholars, in fact, in the early 80s, wondering whether um, this compression in income was permanent. Um, but now when we look at back, um, you know, it's, it's clear that, that, um, that, that, that it hasn't been. So um, we can take this top 10% who have, you know, over time been, um, you know, getting a larger and larger share of sort of the total pie, and we can divide this up even further. And so we can look at sort of like the top 5 to 10%, and this is what's been happening to their income share over time. And what's interesting is that in contrast to what this figure looks like, their share, um, it's been pretty flat, you know, um, and just rising somewhat slightly. We can sort of look at the top, you know, sort of one, uh, one to five percent, and and their income share, and you know, there also it, you know, their income share looks fairly flat over time, uh, maybe you know, rising slightly, but then if you look at the top one percent, and look at what's been happening to their income share over time, um, in you know, 2008 it was you know maybe around 16, 17 percent of um, total aggregate income. Um, and it's gone up substantially. Um, just to recap, if, you know, again, if income were evenly divided, the top 1% would be, you know, their share would be 1%. Um, the fact that it's, you know, much higher than that, you know, so, and, and that, you know, the fact that that share has just risen tremendously um, among that 1% um, suggests that much of the movement in inequality that's been happening over time um, is being driven by what's happening to that top 
Okay, and so it's a very small number of households um, that are driving, that's driving sort of the overall um, trends in inequality. And so one thing, you know, one direct implication of having um, a lot of wealth income inequality is that um, wealth inequality uh, is, is, is quite large. And so what I'm showing here um, are different levels of wealth at different percentiles of the wealth distribution um, in 1998, 2001, 2004, and 2007. And so what you see here is that the top 10% of households in 2007 had um, their average net worth was around $800,000. Um, in contrast, the bottom, uh, uh, a household at the 25th percentile of the wealth distribution, um, their uh, average wealth was around $10,000. And what's striking about wealth, wealth inequality, it's a little bit hard to see um, in this graph compared to what, what I show, showed earlier, is that, you know, one, wealth inequality, like income inequality, has been growing over time. Um, and two, wealth inequality is much starker than income inequality. Um, and then another measure of inequality that economists like to look at is um, consumption inequality. And, you know, just sort of ignoring for a second what the units are, um, like if this number is big, it means that there's more inequality, you know. If it's small, it means that there's less inequality. Um, we can also see that consumption inequality has been growing over time. Um, but sort of, I guess, the, the happy side to this picture is that consumption inequality is, um, is, 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 is considerably less than income inequality. And so, you know, as, as people and as economists and as, um, you know, policy-minded individuals, we can think about, you know, what is it that we actually care about, you know, as, as a society? Do we care about income inequality or, um, you know, what we think that income, you know, gets people, namely consumption? Um, and, and that's, you know, a pretty interesting thing to talk about, and it's a subject of um, pretty vigorous policy debate. So um, why do we think that um, income inequality has been growing over time? Uh, much of the scholarship here is, um, is, is focused on a search for proximate causes. It's not as if we can run these grand experiments with, you know, in the United States involving the entire economy. And so what um, economists then have to do is sort of like look for suggestive evidence here and there. And um, there are two sort of broad categories of explanations. Um, one is that there have been some serious and major changes to the wage structure, and then the other set of explanation, um, explanations have, you know, sort of more to do with tax policy and changing social norms. But focusing first on, you know, what we think um, has been happening to the wage, wage structure, there, within this um, set of explanations, there, there are three categories. The first is um, uh, what economists call skill bias technical change. The second is um, an explanation uh, owing to changes in labor market institutions like the minimum wage or um, uh, unions. And then the third explanation um, has to do with globalization and trade. So to talk about this a little bit more um, in detail, um, skill bias technical change is just the idea that um, you know, technology and skill are complements. And so when um, you know, computers, um, we're, you know, first introduced in the workplace, say, in the, you know, in the late 70s, and as their um, adoption and use grew over time, um, the relative demand for skilled labor increased. And because um, the, that, that relative demand increased, that, um, you know, raised the incomes and the wages of, uh, of um, more skilled or college-educated workers. And, um, Consistent with that explanation, just so just focused on the, the solid line, you know, what you see over time is that um, the wage differential between college and high school graduates has been growing. And so it's great that all of you are in college. <laughs> um, good job. Um, so, and, and so, so, so turning to the second sort of um, explanation um, in terms of what we think has changed about the, um, about the overall wage structure, 
Um, you know, first, we think that uh, unionization increased between 1929 and 1950, and that was a period when you see um, when you see the income distribution um, compress and become um, less wide um, and more narrow. Um, and then union, unionization has started to decline in the 1970s as um, manufacturing um, declined in the economy. Um, also, over time, you know, Congress they set a nominal minimum wage. Over time, the minimum wage erodes. And um, in the late 70s and throughout the 80s and 90s, you see a serious erosion of the real minimum wage. Um, we already talked about the decline in unions. And then, um, you know, we also think that there um, might have been some changes in uh, wage setting norms in terms of how um, companies pay their workers and the benefits that they get. And so what all this means is that, you know, over time we think that, you know, maybe these labor market, you know, these changes to, you know, some labor market institutions have compressed um, the wage distribution. And then finally, um, you know, I think it's well known to anybody who's, you know, ever bought an, an iPod where it says, you know, designed in, um, in California, made in China, um, you know, globalization and trade have had um, serious you know, impacts on, on the economy. Um, and in particular, there's been a serious decline in manufacturing and increase in foreign outsourcing. And, you know, you know, we think that, you know, these forces could decrease the relative demand for less skilled labor, um, sort of leading to, um, you know, wider inequality. Um, finally, just turning to a different set of explanations um, surrounding tax policy and social norms, um, in, in um, World War II, there were um, some wage controls that um, that were enforced and um, implemented, and and you know that would tend, you know, people think that that had the effect of compressing the wage distribution. Um, say after World War II and um, through the 60s, and um, you know almost up until uh, maybe 1980, in the early 80s, um, marginal tax rates for the highest income brackets were very high. I think um, in the 60s, the 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 top marginal bracket was at. 90%, 91% or something like that. Um, you know, and also, uh, when, you, you, when you see inequality fall is, you know, around the time that um, a lot of the New Deal programs were passed and also when a lot of um, great, you know, society programs were passed, you know, that, and th these programs introduced things like Social Security, um, which, um, you know, was, was designed to address um, poverty among the elderly. Um, uh, you know, in the 60s, we also saw uh, uh, welfare or aid to families with dependent children, um, which was, you know, designed to alleviate poverty among um, women with children, you know, who were, you know, either widows or divorced um, women. And so, you know, we, we have these large redistributive programs, and these programs, they've changed a lot since um, they were first um, designed and introduced. You know, in 1996, we had a major... Um, and changed to the way welfare was uh, implemented. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid have, um, and, and their benefit levels have also changed a lot. Um, and then also, and then finally, uh, we, think, we think, you know, that um, there have been social norms that have changed um, since the 1970s um, in that, you know, maybe we as a society, you know, maybe we're different. You know, maybe we're more willing to tolerate, you know, high CEO pay or, you know, high, you know maybe we're more willing to to tolerate high pay in the financial services industry. And um, what's a little bit unfortunate is that the economics profession just doesn't have a clear answer for, for why we think in income inequality um, has been um, increasing. I think Tim and I would probably have different perspectives on this. Um, as would, you know, sort of any two randomly selected, you know, economists. <laughs> um, and, and the reason why is that um, there are a lot of puzzles that sort of remain, and there's no sort of one single unifying view for why we think um, income inequality has increased. Um, what we know is that, you know, within skill and within industry groups, so within college, you know, educated workers, say like working within the same industry, um, inequality has, you know, has widened over time. Um, but at the same time, the gender gap and the race gap have narrowed. Um, and so, you know, what's, what's kind of interesting is that um, just in, in, in the world, I'm not making a normative statement, men are more likely to use computers than women are. Um, 
And, and so if you believed the skill bias technical change story, you would think that men would be earning more because the relative, their relative, the relative demand for men has increased, but that's actually not, is contrary to what's happened. Um, you know, if anything, the, the, the gender gap has, um, has, has de decreased over time. Um, so it turns out that France has computers too. And um, inequality didn't go up you know, in France in, in sort of the same way that it did in the US. And so you know, that it, that's, that's hard to explain if you believe the, the skill bias technical change story. Um, it's hard to think of how um, you know, the, the minimum wage and the erosion of the minimum wage in unions um, would explain widening inequality at the top. And so there's a lot of research on what, um, what uh, you know, whether the spillover effects from these labor market institutions um, are large or small, and you know, it's a topic of vigorous debate and, um, and research. Um, and then what's interesting is that you know, some of the wage controls in World War II um, were lifted, but inequality remained low you know, for quite some time until you know, at least the 1970s. Um, and so it's, it's hard to think of you know, whether you know, the, the role of tax policy can be fully satisfactory in terms of um, answering uh, some of these questions. And so um, I think that brings me, yeah, that brings me to the end of my remarks. Um, it's been really interesting to sort of revisit this topic. Um, like, like Rebecca said, um, I'm, you know, I, much of my research um, focuses on what um, what happens sort of at the lower end of the income distribution, and so um, I study uh, financial decision making among low and moderate income households, why they might choose to use check cashers or payday lenders. Um, I've also done a lot of work on housing policy and sort of its impact on low and moderate income households, and so um, just the topic of inequality provides, I guess, the broader context um, for for what I do and what I think about. And um, and so it's been it's been a lot of fun to to put this together. And so I'm gonna um, hand over the the podium to Tim. Thanks. So now I get. how to get rid of the thing on the side. Anyone? To the yeah, left, to the left. Top, to from beginning. From beginning. I'm with you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so my name's Tim Taylor. I graduated from Haverford in 82. It sounds like the beginning of sort of an Alcoholics Anonymous confession. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I was in the second to the last all-male class at Haverford. So um, women came in as freshmen during my junior year. Um, there were women on campus as transfer students before that. Um, my understanding is the, the dorm relationship, the dorm transfer with Bryn Mawr was a lot higher then. There were probably about 300 Haverfordians living at Bryn Mawr at any given time, about 300 Bryn Mawrters living at Haverford at any given time. So the, I'm, I'm in a way much more tightly interrelated to the Bryn Mawr class of 82 than I suspect some of you are to your equivalent Bryn Mawr classes now. Um, for those of you who are seniors looking at the job market, I feel your pain. Uh, 1982, unemployment was about 10%. There had been stagflation, there had been inflation, things looked terrible in the world economy. I didn't know what to do with my life, so I took the GMAT and the GRE and the LSAT, and I would have taken any other <laughs> exam they would have given me, and I ended up um, going to graduate school at Stanford in economics. Um, which I hated, um, and, I, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I found that um, I was in many ways a fish out of water in a graduate program in economics, and I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of people, like your professors here, and, and Jane, and I mean this with all due respect, are really, really expert. I mean, they really know what it is they study. They know it at a level where their peers in the world of academic research, there's probably only a couple other dozen people in the world who know the level, know the subject to the depth that they do, and know the level of detail and precision of exactly what's going on. And I found that trying to do work at that level of depth and, and detail 
bored me silly. Um, and for a lot of subjects, um, basically, I really like to go to lunch with experts, and I like to have them say to me, what are you working on lately? And they tell me, and I love having lunch with them, and then I'm glad not to think about it anymore for a while. And so, um, so I bailed out of graduate school, I went and I became an editorial writer for a newspaper in California, the Mercury News. Um, I wrote editorials for them for a few years, and then I was hired by um, Joe Stiglitz, name some of you probably know, he won a Nobel Prize a few years back, to start this new economics journal, the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and I was hired to do that in 1986, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, the, um, for me, it's a great job, and the great thing is I have a grasshopper mind, and the subjects in the journal change all the time, so I don't have to have that nasty, in-depth learning that makes me crazy. Um, <laughs> So um, let's talk a little about all this stuff. I figure it's the 21st century, so what we say when we introduce ourselves is what websites am I affiliated with? <laughs> and so, um, so if you want to look at the journal, I assume many of you have been assigned it, it's now actually available free online to anybody going back 12 years. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing, I think. Um, they have my blog up there. If you want to see the sorts of incredibly dull things I read every day, uh, they're up there. And then there's a professional website uh, that just sort of has my CD and stuff like that. Um, Jane was focused on sort of U.S. stuff over the last few decades. I'm going to try and do some global stuff. And um, I guess what I'll start with is um, two things that almost all Haverfordians believed about inequality in 1982 when I graduated, both of which are now clearly wrong. Um, so the first belief was that um, U.S. inequality was pretty much a constant. And Jane put up a very nice figure there showing that the top 10% pretty much had the same share. So when we studied inequality in the late 70s and early 80s, what we learned was that in the U.S. it's pretty much a constant. Um, now, of course, um, you think back when somebody like, say, John F. Kennedy said in 1963, a rising tide lifts all ships. Um, that was actually sort of true at the time, because if inequality is more or less a constant and the economy grows, everybody grows with it, more or less equally, right? And so, um, and so that was a, a true statement when he made it. It was a true statement circa 1975. Um, it hasn't been so true since then. Um, in fact, um, if, um, if you read, say, Paul Krugman's popular writing in the early and mid-1990s, he's writing then that, you know, some people think there's this inequality thing, but probably that's a temporary thing because actually we know that inequality is pretty much a constant. Well, you know, now it's, it's 20 years later, so we don't accept that explanation quite as easily, but I give you a sense of how entrenched that belief was. Um, second wrong belief that um, all my fellow graduates and I had was that um, as economies developed, um, inequality would follow a certain pattern, which is called a Kuznets curve. Um, and a Kuznets curve looks like this. Um, Kuznets curve obviously raises the question, who was Simon Kuznets? And, um, and I assume that not everybody knows. Um, when they started giving the Nobel Prize in economics in 1969, it was sort of an interesting moment, because if you think about it, there hadn't been any previous Nobel Prizes, right? And so, in economics. And so, they could choose from the entire universe of economists. There were no previous winners. At some level, the first few people they gave the prize to would be thought of as the most preeminent economists in the world. So that was a, a high-powered set of prizes, since they could draw on everyone who'd been an economist in the 20th century. So who'd they choose? Well, the the very first economics prize goes to the two most qualified northern Europeans they could find. And so there's a Ragnar Frisch of Norway and Jan Tinbergen of, of Holland. <laughs> and they're both um, very deserving winners. And if you know their work, they're both great economists. There's no question about it. But I do believe their geographic roots had something to do with it. Um, the, second, um, the second winner then was uh, Paul Samuelson, who's clearly a great economist of the 20th century. You know, anyone would put him in the top handful. And then the the third winner was Simon Kuznets, just to give you a sense of how prominent he was at the time. So what did Kuznets do, and why is that nobody's ever heard of him? Kuznets invented GDP. Um, he invented how to measure an economy. And because he invented how to measure an economy, he was then able to do all sorts of work about, say, economic growth. Because if you can measure an economy, you can measure how it grows and changes. You can compare across time. You can compare across countries. You can do all sorts of cool econometrics. There's a reason if you look at a lot of economic statistics, they go back to about 1950, 19, that's when Kuznets figured out how to measure GDP. And, um, and it was a really complicated process. He really got his hands dirty in measuring it. And so um, that was thought of as, as, a, as an award which was really remarkable in terms of what he 
did that everybody uses all the time. So, 1954, Kuznets is president of the American Economic Association. He gives a talk on uh, economic growth and income. And the basic idea of the talk, looking at economic history over time, goes something like this. Societies start off pre-industrial. Um, there's lots of farmers. Basically, everybody's equally poor. So you're at the far left side of this graph. Inequality is low, and it's a poor country, right? Then what happens over time is the economy begins to grow, and you get certain areas of manufacturing or stuff popping up. And as those things pop up around the economy, then um, people move off the farm, they move to the city, they take jobs, and you get this inequality where you've got richer folks who are working in certain areas and poorer folks who are still back on the farm somewhere. And so inequality rises up to a certain point. And then as you get past that point, as lots and lots of people have transferred over the cities, then you get more and more people in the urban area. And, um, and so, so many people are in the urban area that you begin to get greater equality happening as more and more people are in that area. And, um, and then the other thing, which he talks about in his speech, is that also in a richer society, he argued, society will enact policies that will lead to greater equality of income. It will lead, enact, for example, old age benefits, social security. It'll, in fact, unemployment benefits. It'll enact, in some countries, uh, national health insurance. Um, it'll enact progressive taxes on the rich. And so those sorts of policy changes changes will also lead to greater equality. So this is what I would have told you in 1982 was the story of inequality as things develop. Now that's um, clearly wrong uh, now because if we had to keep drawing that, you know, given Jane's data, we'd have another, another drop and then it would start rising again. So we'd have some sort of a weird squiggle up there. Um, let's look at a little data on that across the world. Um, so this is data on English-speaking countries. It's the share of the top 1% in those countries. And I guess what I'm trying to mention here really is, it's what Jane said a moment ago, this trend in inequality is not just a US trend since the 70s, it's a trend in a lot of countries where you see this drop and then sort of in the late 70s, early 80s, you see a rise again. The US is the red line, so you can see we're kind of leading the way, but we're definitely not alone in this. And so um, when you talk about explanations for inequality, a lot of economists steer away from what did the U.S. do in tax policy, what did the U.S. do in unions, what did the U.S. do in minimum wages. Because if you've got a trend that cuts across lots and lots of countries, you want an explanation that cuts across lots and lots of countries too. You don't want a country-specific explanation. And that's why people start turning toward things like skill-based technical change or, or other kinds of things that might cut across a lot of different countries. Now, now, this is, as I said, English-speaking countries. Um, it's not just those. Um, here's Nordic and Southern European countries. And um, you can see that even in a lot of Nordic countries, there's a little bit of a rise at the end. It's not as sharp as in the English-speaking countries. But you can see there's a little bit of a U-shape there. Uh, happens a little bit later, maybe in the 80s instead. But um, again, a bunch of countries were seeing some sort of a rise there in inequality. Continental European econ economies, um, Jane mentioned that France hasn't seen a lot of rise, and you see a lot of these others haven't either, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Japan. So they haven't seen the rise, even though they've also seen a lot of the same technological trends and other trends the U.S. has seen. It becomes, as you can imagine, difficult to figure out a pattern when all these countries are going every which way. Um, and then final example top 1% in a few developing countries. And you can see a number of them um, are having essentially sort of what we might call the Kuznets curve experience, which is as their growth takes off, they're getting a greater level of inequality, rising inequality now. And that's true, for example, China is the little red line in the bottom right where we don't have good data until about the early 1980s, but you can see inequality there rising. And a lot of these other countries as well that as growth develops in certain places but not other areas, they become more unequal for a time. And then there's a question of whether later on they might, they might have a US-like experience in the middle of this century. Um, uh, an economist, uh, Arnold Harberger, once gave a talk I liked where he, he hypothesized and argued about whether economic growth was like yeast or mushrooms. And his argument was, if economic growth is like yeast, then the whole economy expands equally, like bread rising. But if the economy is like mushrooms and growth pops up here and there, you're going to see inequality followed perhaps by later things growing in other ways. And so in a way, this is, this is a, a mushroom theory of growth. Um, so um, 
clearly we need a story that goes past Kuznets to say what's happened here. And Jane has laid out a lot of the arguments for you, and there's not a lot I can add to that. Um, but I'll, add, I'll try and add two little pieces. Um, one is that um, a lot of the way people have changed their arguments over time, the way economists argued in the 40s and 50s in the style of Kuznets was in a way not that different from the way they argued at the time of, of say, Marx in the 19th century, Adam Smith before him. They thought about these big historical patterns. They kind of said in the big historical pattern, what would happen, what would rise, what would fall. Um, I would say modern economists tend not to argue that way. What we tend to argue about is what happened to supply and demand. And it's a little less interesting in a way, but sometimes a little bit more revealing. So if we're going to talk about inequality, one of the things we want to talk about is demand and supply for labor. And, you know, why do certain people get paid certain ways? Well, think about demand and supply. So two Harvard economists, uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz, and Jane was using some of their work as well, uh, calculated uh, based on a demand and supply for late skilled labor over time for college-educated workers. And basically, a supply is coming from education levels of workers. Demand is coming from certain kinds of um, ways in which those workers are hired and, some, and I think some wage premium evidence. But the point here is that you can see that in the 1915 period up till about 1935 on their data, um, demand for skilled workers is higher than supply. It's growing more rapidly. So that's a time of high income inequality in Jane's data. Then, starting in the 1930s and 1940, you can see the supply of skilled workers keeps rising. Demand for those workers drops off. Uh, that's the Depression, and you know that's not a real great time for skilled workers. And so that's a time when inequality um, doesn't, doesn't rise. And then the two sort of run side by side for a while. And then when you get up to the late 1970s, there's a period where demand for skilled labor is rising quickly and supply isn't expanding as fast. And so Claudia and, and, and Larry would, would then point to this kind of data, which is what's the wage premium of skilled versus unskilled labor? Well, you know, if demand is high and supply is low, it looks one way, then, you know, this pattern more or less tracks what I gave you in the previous graph in terms of when there's a lot of demand, then that tends to make skilled labor get paid more. Um, the vision I have here, which is maybe useful to enunciate is, in the old days, meaning like when I graduated from college, um, if you talked about a big organization, there would be something like, say, a big sales organization. There'd be a national head of sales. There'd be like eight regional heads of sales. There'd be, each one would have 15 district heads of sales, and each one of them would have 20 salesmen, right? And what would happen is the salesmen would report up the chain all the time. And a lot of what the managers did was just keep track of people who were out there. What happens now is that the salesmen um, can report directly. They just plug in you know, their, their electronic communication. They report directly to a spreadsheet. And whoever's managing them at the national level can just look at a spreadsheet. And the software, SAP or whatever it is, can just say to them, who's ahead of quota, who's behind quota, who's doing, did we lose a big customer, did we gain a big customer? And so all those middle levels of management disappeared. My current boss at the journal, David Otter, calls this the hollowing out of the U.S. wage distribution. That person at the top becomes, in a way, an economic superstar. They can collect all the money that would have been collected for overseeing those workers. And, and so I think that some of the explanation for inequality, and I don't know about all, but some of it is the sense that um, the growth of technology lets people have become sort of economic superstars. It lets some people magnify their earning power in interesting ways. And I gave you sort of an obvious example, but there's a lot of non-obvious examples if you think about it. And so I think that's part of what's going on out there. The other thing I'd mention that Jane mentioned in passing but is worth saying is that um, one of the things that changes household income inequality as opposed to wage inequality is that marriage patterns have changed in the U.S. Um, there's now economists who study marriage study what they call assortative mating. And what that basically means is it used to be in the old days, uh, 50 years ago, that what was common was a high-powered earner, typically a man, would marry a lower-powered earner, typically a woman, who would probably drop out of the labor force after that. And so you sort of think mentally, it's like you know the old story of doctor marrying nurse or lawyer marrying secretary or something like that. Now what happens, of course, is doctor marries doctor, lawyer marries lawyer, CEO marries CEO. Now if you think about that from a household point of view, it means that whatever inequality you have in wages is magnified because now you have two high earners in every family instead of one. 
And so people who look at household income instead of wage income argue that something like half of the increase in inequality is a result of um, this assortative mating, high earners marrying high earners, which has a fairly recent development in US economic history. So what global patterns come out of all this? If inequality is rising in a lot of countries, but not rising in every country, you might think that overall global inequality should be rising. But you would be wrong. Um, because um, what's happening in the world is that, of course, India and China and some other countries are growing very rapidly. And their growing inequality within those countries is actually reducing inequality at a global level as they catch up. So. Um, this is the world distribution of income, that's what WDI stands for here, and the individual country distributions in 1970. So a couple things to observe here. Um, one is that um, you can see per capita income is on the horizontal axis on a log scale, and then thousands of people getting that amount of income, or you can think of it as millions if you want, are, um, are on the, the vertical axis. So. Um, if you look at the world distribution of income, you can see it peaks way up there at about a dollar a day, which is what the World Bank treats as the poverty line for consumption in the world economy. And you can see China and India are almost smack under that dollar a day. You can see that's sort of the peak of the world income distribution. And way out there on the right, you can see the US, you can see Japan lagging behind some, you can see the USSR. And so that's, that's the world distribution of income circa 1970. Now, what does that look like if we flip it forward about 30 years? And, you know, we just don't have good data going back much before this. Um, but you can see the world bump now is moved strongly out to the right. You can see that India and China in particular aren't, China's now well above the bump. India is more or less still under the, where the median is. It's poor countries like Nigeria, which are now the bottom of the distribution. You can see way over there on the right is the US. Since the 1970s, Japan has caught up some to the U.S., so it's fairly close. FSU is former Soviet Union, so that's, that's the bump there. But what's happening in a way, if you think about it, is the world income distribution used to be left skewed. It was toward the poor people of the world. And what's happened over the last few decades is the world in income distribution is now more middle. The, 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 the curve is more centered, if you want. And so that means that if you measure equality or inequality in various ways, you're going to have a greater level of equality than you did before. Um, so what does that look like in practice? Uh, this is just the shift from 1970 to 1980, 1990, 2000. So you can just sort of see how it's been moving over time, getting a little more centered. Um, so worldwide, what does that mean? Um, what's on the left-hand axis here is something called the Gini coefficient, and um, it's not important that you know exactly what that is. We can talk later if you like. But basically, it's a way of measuring the whole income distribution where zero would be perfect equality. Everyone has exactly the same, and 100 would be perfect inequality, like one person has everything, okay? And so um, you can see a fairly equal country like Sweden over time, is at that level. You can see a fairly unequal country like the US in the middle there. You can see a country like Brazil, a lot of Latin America is extremely unequal, higher, and then you can see the world above that is still more unequal than any individual country. You also see in the world income distribution though that little dip down at the end. And this data goes through 2008. We don't honestly know if that's going to keep going or not, but there's at least some plausibility that it might. Um, so we're living in a world where th many countries have increasing inequality, but the world overall is maybe seeing decreasing inequality. Um, so um, I guess my question then is, you know, where are we headed in the long term? And I, the metaphor I like to use here is, is one from Robert Lucas, who's a Nobel laureate economist, and I, I sometimes call it the Lucas horse race. Um, Lucas argued that you can think of the world economy as something like this. Um, starting in about, um, he said, think about in 1800, there's a big race, a horse race, and uh, they're all starting gates. Every country is behind its own starting gate, okay? And then what happens in about 1800 is the starting gate goes up for the U.S. and Great Britain and maybe Holland. And those, two horse, those three horses start going down the track. And they're going about 2% a year growth. And they get ahead. And then maybe 30 years later, the gate goes up for Germany. 
And maybe 30 years after that, the gate goes up for Sweden. And maybe about, you know, 1950, the gate goes up for Japan. In 1980, the gate goes up for China. But the trick is, he says, that any time the gate goes up for a country which is not one of the leaders, the leaders just keep trundling along at about 2%, however far behind you start gives you a catch-up period of faster growth. And the further behind you are when you start, the faster you'll be able to grow for at least a time. And of course, as you get closer and closer, that catch-up growth diminishes. And so his argument is that between about, and numbers on this, which I, are a little hard to estimate, but uh, illustrative numbers, if you take the top 10 richest countries in the world as of 1870 and the bottom 10 richest countries in the world in 1870, the per capita GDP ratio between those is about 8 to 1. The richest are about eight times as rich as the poorest. You do the same exercise, 10 richest in 1990 versus 10 riches, or 10 bottom ones, the ratio is about 45 to 1. Now what happened over that time was these folks at the top kept going ba-doom, 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 and the folks at the bottom, the gate hasn't opened yet. I mean, these are subsistence level living countries in places like South Asia and certain parts of Africa. And so um, we've seen a huge divergence in global inequality over the last couple of centuries. But, Lucas argues, as the gates go up in China, as they go up in India, as they perhaps go up in Brazil and Latin America, as they go up in parts of Africa as well, his argument is, for what it's worth, and you know, he's got one more Nobel Prize than I do, that, the, um, that, the, that the, this century will be a century of enormous global convergence and that there'll be a century of enormous global catch-up. And so every time you see something about how China and India are going to grow very, very rapidly over the next you know, 30 or 40 years, that's global convergence in action. And so that may be the new pattern that we may be seeing over the next few decades. So um, how much does any of this matter, uh, I guess, is the next question. And um, it's maybe a question only an economist could ask. But I'll give you a quotation I ran into when I was writing my senior thesis in 1982 on what is a fair income tax. Um, this uh, University of Chicago economist, Henry Simons, had a quotation which lots of people used to use about that time and basically said, um, you know, if you want to really have a progressive income tax, basically it's an ethical or an aesthetic judgment that the distribution of income is evil or unlovely. And that was um, Simon's very polite way of saying, this isn't about economics, this is about what you like, what makes you feel warm and fuzzy. And so again, um, there was a, a strong line of argument, and I think it's, you know, it's one worth thinking about. What do you really care about? Do you care about poverty? Or do you care about inequality? And no, they are not the same. If you lived in a country where everybody had national health insurance and decent housing and good schools and a safe neighborhood, would you really care if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett got an extra you know, few hundred million dollars? Is it the inequality that bothers you or is it the poverty? And it's not an easy question to disentangle. It's something to really mull over. But a lot of time when people talk about inequality, they immediately start talking about the extremely poor. And my economist brain says inequality isn't poverty. Poverty isn't inequality. You know, and, and if you care about inequality, you have to care about the spread. Um, you could fix inequality by making everyone equally poor. Presumably that's not the right goal or the right solution. So somehow trying to figure that out is, is an important policy choice. So why might it matter? Why might it really matter in some practical way that goes beyond a judgment about evil or unlovely? Um, well, I'll give you two possibilities and then I'll shut up and we can do other things. Um, so one is that it might affect economic growth. Now, um, the argument here is historically a tricky one because economists used to argue that you needed a lot of inequality to generate economic growth. And the old argument was in order to have economic growth, you needed to have investment in physical plant and equipment. And you could only way you could get that is if you had rich people with a lot of capital to invest. Um, in the last 30 or 40 years, the argument has become more that in order to get economic growth, you need well-educated population and workforce. And if you're going to have a well-educated population and workforce, then almost by definition, skills are going to be more widely distributed, earning opportunities are going to be more widely distributed, you will have invested a lot in people. And so in that case, equality might be better. Um, the difficult part of all these sorts of arguments is that if you look at these graphs, again, these are these Gini coefficient things, what you basically see is that the poorest parts of the world over and over are the two at the top, are the most unequal parts, are the two at the top, Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. It's the poorest in the 60s, poorest in the 70s, poorest in the 80s, poorest in the 90s, and poorest in the 2000s. 
So whenever you try and do some sort of comparison where you say, um, you know, does inequality lead to poverty? Does inequality slow down growth? You take all the countries in the world, you put them in a big data set, you start trying to draw best fit lines and use all your statistics tools. The problem is all the points that are most unequal are Latin America, and Latin America is not the poorest part of the world. It's in the middle. If Africa was the poorest part of the world, we'd have an argument, but it's not. And then there are all these other parts of the world that, you know, uh, were quite unequal for a long time, like India and China. They were extremely equal economies. Everybody was poor. Didn't seem to be helping them grow. Everybody was poor. And so trying to track down a connection statistically between inequality and growth has just been a mare's nest. And as of the 90s or the early 2000s, I think the sort of basic answer a lot of people gave was that if you, in the jargon, tried to use cross-country time series regressions to answer growth questions, you just couldn't do it. It, it just wasn't possible. Um, now, there's some more recent evidence on this which argues that maybe it is possible. There's some guys from the IMF who've been doing work on the subject of how long do economic upswings last. And their argument is that every area and every country has economic upswings, but in a lot of places those upswings falter and die, and then they go into some other difficult time. So think of Latin America with its periods of upswing and then lost decade, and upswing and lost decade. Whereas places like Japan or East Asia had their upswing and didn't have the lost decade in between. They argue that the degree of inequality is very correlated with whether or not you have these fluctuations in growth or not. And the argument being that when things go bad, a fairly equal economy doesn't overreact or do crazy stupid stuff. But an unequal economy might overreact to bad news, do crazy stupid stuff, and end up turning a relatively small problem into a very big problem. So that sort of linkage between inequality and political decision making is something worth mulling, given that we're living in a fairly unequal economy now. Um, the other possibility is the other reason for caring about inequality is the most basic one of all. Um, it comes out of um, you know, thinking in, in economics that goes back a couple of centuries, but the, the sort of classic work is by a Nobel economist named uh, James Mirlees, and it's it, what's called optimal tax theory. And it basically comes out of the basic thought that if you've got a rich person with income, the, the happiness or enjoyment or pleasure they get out of that income, out of the marginal dollar, the five millionth dollar, the 10 millionth dollar, the 20 millionth dollar, is going to be less than the marginal happiness or satisfaction that a poor person gets out of their 10,000th dollar or 20,000th dollar. And so if you redistribute from the high income person to the low income person, society as a whole will be better off. The gains to those who gain will bring greater happiness than, those who, than the losses to those who lose. Um, now, that argument um, holds up in a wide variety of theoretical contexts, but there's obviously a big trade-off here, and the big trade-off is that you can't just take from the rich because they have to worry about their incentives as well. And um, one thing that's always worth remembering is we would never expect perfect e equality in any society, right? I mean, people, some people are young just out of college. Some people are 50 years old and at the prime of their career. Some people like to work hard in the workforce. Some people like to volunteer. Some people like to go to the beach and surf. Um, you know, just, there's a wide variety of things people prefer. There's a wide variety of personality types. And there's an element of luck, you know, that you may take up a subject that lets you start a company and make a lot of money, and someone else may take up a subject that doesn't. Some people win the lottery, some don't. Some people get, you know, terrible illnesses and some don't. And so um, we don't expect perfect equality, but it is nonetheless unsettling when the degree of inequality keeps rising and rising and we're having a hard time figuring out why. Um, so there's this trade-off that it's good to redistribute because society, some broad sense, will feel better, but we have to worry about what the incentives are we're providing. And I've had to relearn all this stuff from scratch in the last year or two because my, my journal a couple of years ago ran an article by a, a co-author by a guy named Greg Mankiw. Some of you might have used his intro text here. I don't know. Greg is um, a Harvard economist who's Republican-leaning. He's now an, an advisor to Mitt Romney. He was uh, in the Council of Economic Advisors for the Bush administration. And we have an article coming by a guy named Peter Diamond, who's an MIT professor, just won a Nobel Prize. And Peter is um, Democratic-leaning. Obama wanted him to be on the federal. Federal Reserve, and he was shut out by some Republicans. They're both optimal tax guys. So they both have the same framework of um, equality is good, but incentives are bad. But they, of course, bring different political biases to it. 
And in these articles, um, Greg ends up arguing, the Republican guy, that the top progressive income rate on the rich should be about 40%. That is to say more or less where it is now, give or take. Peter, on the other hand, ends up arguing the top rate on the rich should be about 70%. Um, and just to put that in perspective, as Jane mentioned, the top rate in the 1970s was 91%, but for various reasons related to exactly what income that related to, nobody really paid the 91% rate, and 70% was actually about the, the common top rate. So one way of saying this is that Greg likes things more or less the way they are, and Peter would turn back the clock to the 1960s there when there was a more equal time frame in those ways. Um, I will leave it to discussion to try and sort out exactly um, what they think about the reactions of people to incentives and, and equality, but that's sort of where they come out. My own take on all this, I guess, is that I have no problem taxing the rich somewhat more. Um, the rich have done very well. Um, I have no problem uh, giving more income to the poor, but um, as you know, linked to work in various ways. But I guess what I worry about most sometimes is that I feel like the discussion about inequality, often among economists at least, gets very wrapped up in income distribution. And it seems to me that the greatest inequalities in our world today are not always about income. They're inequalities in the safety of your neighborhood, the quality of your school, the quality of your local park or library. Um, in the day-to-day -day stuff that doesn't have to do with do you have enough income to afford a television, do you have enough income to afford going to McDonald's. And so I guess those seem to me harder problems to solve because they're not fundamentally problems of handing people money. They're problems of organizing our society in a way that breaks up concentrations of, of inequality and of dysfunctional poverty. So that's all for me. Thanks, everybody.